you did work in Las Vegas and you did work in the commercial world, so mm -hmm. to speak. I know we don't want to talk about it a lot, but in terms of contrasting the two worlds, mm -hmm. there you are with McBurney and there you are with Bette Midler. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? I don't think I approached it in a different way than, um, you know, I would approach. But, and it was an incredibly complicated process because we went through a lot of different designs to get to the kind of final process. Um, you know, the difference is, is that it's not, the big difference with that was it wasn't story driven. Um, so, and I felt very much um, on shaky ground because I didn't really have, it wasn't being driven by a narrative. Um, and so, and, and in fact, the narrative that comes out of this kind of selection of songs that are put together changes every day. So, so you know, you might put this song at the beginning and then they think, well, oh, no, no, let's put it at the end. Let's put that one at the beginning and let's put that one at the end. So, in fact, you never know what you're making. Um, and so that, that's what was very different from, from about that, is that they have a song list that changes on a daily basis right up until the opening night. So, um, you know, and then you just keep working around that. So, in fact, I designed a sort of, again, a sort of structure in which that could change a little bit. I mean, it's, you know, you're designing a bandstand and then you're some other things. Um, and there are specifically set pieces in what she does because she does these characters. Um, and, but you kind of never know whether things are going to be used or not because they might change from a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and yeah, it's a little bit different in that way. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel more comfortable in a narrative um, when I know uh, trying to kind of solve the problem of storytelling. I'm, I, I like storytelling. Um, mm. And the directors that I work with and the companies that I work with like telling stories to people. So I'm sort of, I think I feel more comfortable in that world. Robert Lepage. You did Tectonic Plates mm. and The Dream, mm -hmm. and he is very collaborative and he takes time mm. to mm. find a way to a performance. Yeah. He also, uh, from the conversation I had with him, you know, watching Ex Machina, he, again, the economic model that has created a certain kind of creativity in the usual nonprofit theaters and regionals or whatever, you know, it's, you know, designs here, rehearsals here, castings here, it's the machine. Mm. He very much said, I had to change the economic model because it was affecting inside too much what I couldn't, couldn't create. Right. Therefore, I had to change it. Mm. And he did. Um, so talk a bit, if you would, about collaborating with Robert. Yeah, well, we did these three things. We did, did you know, um, Tectonic Plates, um, Midsummer Night's Dream, and uh, Bluebird's Castle and Avartam, which we did here. Um, and I really liked working with Robert. I love working with Robert. Ro Robert has this wonderful quality. There are very, you know, there's a, it's a very, one a thing that's really difficult to do is to construct a theatrical moment. It's very difficult, I think, because it's a whole series of moments that are live, that are put together. And every single moment takes this enormous construction in order to make that moment. And, you know, if you're watching from the audience, you don't realize that, you know, to create one second of theater or, well, 10 seconds of theater can take, you know, weeks to get the right feeling of that, you know, the right quality of that. And to hit the right note, for the actor to hit the right note, for the lighting to hit the right note, for the set to be there, you know, there's a whole construction that comes around these series of live moments that are pieced together. And I think Robert has a, an innate ability to make a beautiful theatrical moment. Um, and it's partly because <clears throat> he has this very, he's not self-censorious self in any way. So he'll approach something and he'll try it out. Um, and can be really messy. I mean, you know, and so sometimes when you see the first version of th some things, they're very messy and things don't quite work in the right order. Um, and then he sort of tinkers with it. And then he takes something 
and it does quite radical tinkering, taking something the end of the scene put at the front of the scene and and then take this scene and take it right out and put it over here, you know, and and so and I find that really interesting because he allows the thing to happen. He sort of sits back objectively and looks at it and then you know, decides what needs to be changed. Whereas there's a lot of and there's a lot of fear making moments in the theater because and so you do a lot of planning and sometimes if you do too much planning you sort of strangle the moment um, so and he kind of lets it happen in a way and he has a company of people and his company in Quebec which makes for a very <coughs> comfortable atmosphere in which they can do that and that they can kind of make mistakes and you know and try to gain and do things and build and build and build and um, so and he also we... has an you know wonderful incredible imagination as well um, and you know, and he has a, a very sort of three-dimensional imagination, um, so he can sort of see around things as well as you know. He kind of, you know, some people can't do that. Um, I want to talk a bit about Robert and the mud. Uh, it's summarized mud, dream. Mud summarized dream. Fair mud summarized dream. Yeah. Very famous production. I yeah. never saw it. I always uh, wished I had. What was that like? Whose idea was the mud? And how did that work? Well, in fact, the mud came out of, I found a picture of a photograph by Annie Leibovitz of Roseanne Barr in, covered in mud. Sort of, in, I think it was Roseanne Barr. It was somebody, it was this great photograph, and I think it was Annie Leibovitz. It was somebody kind of, like in a kind of mud fight. And, and I showed it to Robert, and I said, there's something about, you know, this is really interesting and exciting. Um, and he was interested and excited in, about that, and so we started to explore the idea of, you know, a, quite a messy forest. And I thought there, in a way, there's something very Canadian about that. I think because. And were fact, you thinking of the lovers, the Lysanders and the Hermias, I mean, or were you about, thinking you know, of getting lost in the forest? Everybody gets lost in the forest, and what is the, you know, again, what is the metaphor of the forest in this particular instance? It's the sort of sexuality. It brings out this. The sort of your deeper emotions, but also, I still think there's something incredibly Canadian about that design. You know, we like to be in the forest is messy and dirty and disgusting. And you know, part of being you know civilized, we have this romantic notion of the forest being a sort of pretty place and you know trees and um, but you know, ten days in the forest and you're like you're covered in dirt and you know. So you've got mosquito bites all over you and you're, you know, it's a mess. It's really messy. And I think um, I felt really strongly that's what they should be experiencing in the production because they're going off away from, they're running away from their civilized environment into this environment, which is on, in one sense releasing something inside them, but in another sense it's like making them become more animal. And that's what it's like to be in the forest. So, you know, and so we started to play this thing, and in fact, it was great because, you know, it had this fantastic effect, you know, so the scene between the four lovers, you know, when it gets really complicated in the middle of the forest, well, they really got into the mud and the water on stage, and so their clothes became completely transparent, so it was like they were naked, and they were, you know, on top of each other, you know, because there's confusion between them all and they're sort of groping each other. And it, so it was like, and there was a great floor that came out of it, which was because um, we used a pool liner with about this much water on it. And the mud was sort of around the edge. edge. It was like a sort of a bowl, a big bowl of mud. And so you could slide across it. It was really great. So, you know, we had moments where sort of Lysander would go, Sliding across it to is it Lysander goes for Hermia, is yeah, right? Yeah, yeah it goes yeah. sliding towards Hermia, and then she would push him away, and he would go around off in the other direction. So it had a kind of its own life. Um, the design it had its you know it was sort of something that was you know you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have been able to plan. There was a kind of you know organic side in, of it in the it practicalities sort of. of, of technical people saying, well, you can't have this mud because it might have germs in it, or we have to change the mud every two days, or, I mean, how did you deal with all the well, technical... Well, that was, it was a huge problem, and that was, again, a kind of situation where it was a big challenge for the National Theatre, because, um, but there was a lot of will behind the production, because it was, I think it was the first production that Robert had done at the National Theatre, um, and 
So there was a great will behind the production to make it work. Um, and so we did all of this weird exploration of me. I remember sort of wandering outside on somebody's farm in the UK on somebody's bit of <laughs> mud <laughs> in an allotment somewhere and thinking, yeah, that feels nice, like it's good mud, but it might be, you know, it was a very difficult situation because we had to find something that was completely inert that, you know, you could remake and wouldn't, um, you know, there would be no bacteria in because you have actors interacting with it. So, in fact, after a fair amount of research, we came up with this stuff called bentonite, which was, it's, um, it's in fact, it's the lubricant for oil rigs, which, you know, when you see those guys at oil rigs all covered with that brown stuff, in fact, part of that is bentonite, which is this lubricant for oil rigs, which looks like mud. It's quite slippery. But you can mix it up in a vat, and it comes out looking like mud, and um, which was the m one of the technical um, staff at the National Theatre found it, and we made a batch of it. It was fantastic because you could mix, mix it up, and they they were playing in a kind of four day rep, so they would have it on stage for four days. Right. It wasn't actually all that complicated to set up because it was you know basically it's a swimming pool on stage with you know kind of a rake around the outside of it. Um, with we had sort of fake mud covered in the bentonite, so you couldn't tell. Um, so there was actually a kind of dry area to run around. Right. right. And then and and some of the actors used it. You know, we used it as part of their costumes. They covered themselves completely with this mud, which then sort of dried, and it was beautiful. Um, and we had the one thing that was really difficult is at the end of the production, there are three very large doors at the back of the Olivier stage, and we had left the stage open, and they lifted, and um, there was this, we had rain bars, and the lovers all walked up towards this beautiful, clean rain and washed themselves off with, um, washed the mud off, which was rather, as they, before they, they go back to the court. And it was a beautiful moment, but it, we couldn't heat the water. It was just too expensive. So there was this terrible sort of kind of moment where this, you know, and Robert kept on just saying, turn up the music more, 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 so that they we, we wouldn't hear them screaming because it was freezing cold. But it was a very beautiful moment.